All right, well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our uh, recurring weekly um, IR research meeting. Uh, this morning, I have the pleasure to uh, introduce again Dr. Song, uh, who is renowned internationally for esophageal stenting and other stent development, and is going to discuss another topic with us this morning, um, some advancements in esophageal stents. Um, titled No Functionalized Stents. And uh, for those of you who have not met Dr. Song, his, uh, his lectures are uh, quite amazing. So um, I'm glad you guys made it this morning and enjoy. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, first, take a look at the take home message regarding the expandable metallic stent in benign esophageal strictures. The bare metallic stent placement in patients with benign esophageal strictures is not is a relative contraindication because uh, here is an example. This is a bare esophageal stent, but after stent placement for patients with recurrent strictures at the anastomosis, you can see severe strictures above, within the stent two months after stent placement. So it's a relative contraindication because the long-term follow-up result is poor. The temporary covered metallic stent placement is safe and useful, but with high recurrence rates. Uh, this is a covered stent we devised. And then uh, we place the stent in a patient with a benign esophageal strictures. Here you can see this is a four months follow-up study. There is no stricture within the stent because this is the covered stent, but you can see new strictures above and below the stent due to tissue hyperplasia. So I can say that Tissue hyperplasia represent a major limitation to long-term stent placement. Uh, we developed selective ALK5 inhibitor eluting stent. This is the covered eluting stent and have therapeutic potential in the treatment of tissue hyperplasia secondary to stent placement. For example, this is the ALK5 inhibitor relating stent, and we press the stent in the rabbit esophagus. This is a two months follow up study, exactly like a patient. You can see strictures above and below the stent. This is the food material. This is a control stent, but drug stent shows excellent result, no strictures above above and below the stand. I agree with the opinion saying it is desirable to use agents that are active in the near infrared region. Gold nanoloads can absorb and scatter strongly in the NIR region. Here you can see beautiful images of gold nanoparticle load. Uh, recently, uh, various nanoparticles, including gold nanoparticles and magnetic nanoparticles, have been actively studied for research, particularly for thermal treatment as a light absorbing uh, photothermal conducting agent, and especially for photothermal therapy to destroy tumor cells. I'd like to introduce our experience with the branched uh, gold nanoparticle coated nitro stand in the esophagus. We developed a uh, branched gold nanoparticle coated nitro stands and investigated the effect of local heating on the near infrared laser irradiation for the suppression of stent induced hyperplasia in red esophagus. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we used a rat or rabbit and placed the stent, and the stent can cause tissue hyperplasia. And then 
we performed irradiation. So we fabricated the gold nanoparticle stand using a two-step synthesis. First, we coated it the bare nitinol stent with the polydopamine, and then the gold nanoparticles were successfully grown on the surface of the stent. We used branched gold nanoparticles developed by Kim and his co-workers in Northwestern University in Chicago. The stent, the nanoparticles are highly efficient near infrared photothermal transducers, including distinct heating efficiency com compared with the conventional spherical gold nanoparticles. This slide shows the illustration of the preparation process for branched gold nanoparticle coated nitinol stent. We used nitinol stent uh, that was uh, 5 millimeters in diameter and 15 millimeters long. It had two barbs in the middle part of the stent to prevent the stent migration and the radio pack mark at the distal and the proximal part for proscopic examination. Uh, these are uh, same images and these are uh, EDS, that is energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopic mapping analysis. And these are uh, same images before and after coating. Here you can see that the nickel and the titanium signals are very strong in uh, nitinol stent and the carbon signals in dopamine coated stent and also gold and nickel in branched gold nanoparticle coated self expandable stent. Uh, this is the same image of the surface of branched gold nanoparticle coated stent. And this is a TEM image. TEM is a transmission electron microscopic image. And this is a UV vis absorption spectra of branched nanoparticles extracted from surface of the coated stand. Here you can see the formation of branches. And then the thickness of the coating was seven micrometers. Uh, here you can see to evaluate the heating profiles of branched gold nanoparticle coated nitinol stent, the coated stent were irradiated with four different laser powers, starting from 0.5 watt to 2.0 watt. Here you can see a proportional temperature increase according to the laser powers. And also here you can see a uniformly temperature increase of the entire stand. A total of 52 rats were included in this study and we divided the uh, rats into four groups. Group A received branched gold nanoparticle coated stent without photothermal uh, therapy. Group B, photothermal therapy at 50 degrees by Celsius degree. And then group C, 65 degrees degrees and group D, eight degrees. Once for 60 seconds, 10 days after stent placement. Again, in this group B, C, D, we perform the local heating for just a 60 seconds, 10 days after stent placement. Three reds per group 
and the three age matched health rates were sacrificed three days after local heating for Western blood analysis to evaluate the heat shock protein 70 expression. The remaining rate was sacrificed four weeks after stent placement for histologic examination to evaluate the tissue response after heating. For example, HE and Mason trichrome staining and immunohistochemistry, including his shock protein 70 and Turner so to see the apto aptosis and alpha SMA to see the smooth muscle cell. And also we evaluate the immunofluorescence with the use of PRDU and KI67 for proliferation. Uh, this is a heating profile of branched gold nanoparticle coated nitrogen stand in ex vivo. As you mentioned, as I mentioned, we used the three healthy uh, red uh, for uh, examinations. So this is the one of the three uh, healthy red. Uh, this is a uh, image obtained before and these two during local heating, and this is after local heating. Here you can see same configuration even after local heating. And also temperature change at both end of the stand with a little difference between them. This is a slide to show the technical steps in stand placement. First, we performed esophagram and then uh, placed the stand in the middle thoracic esophagus with the use of uh, 1.5 millimeter stent delivery system and after stent placement. And then uh, for local heating the stent, uh, we used uh, fiber, is an optic fiber, 10 days after stent placement. We introduced the uh, optic fiber into a six French character. Uh, here you can see this is a stent, and this is a six French character with a radio pack mark. And we introduced the optic fiber into the six French sheets. Uh, this slide shows the flow diagram uh, regarding the result. A total of eight reds were excluded from data analysis because of deaths in three reds and stent migration in five reds. Again, uh, we performed local heating 10 days after stent placement and then uh, three reds per group were sacrificed three days after local heating. The remaining reds were sacrificed four weeks after stand placement. This is an image immediately after local heating in a group of B red and endoscopic photogram four weeks after stand placement in a control group red. And this is a four weeks after stand placement in a group B red. You can see a whitish uh, discoloration adjacent to the stent wire immediately after local heating. You can see severe tissue hyperplasia four weeks after stent placement. Compared to four weeks after stent placement in a group B, so there is a widely patent stent with no tissue hyperplasia, amazing result. Heat shock protein 70 expressions after local heating gradually increased in a heating dose dependent manner. For example, beta-rectin is a control 
So you can see the strong signal in group D. Uh, this is a H stand and this is a Mason trichrome stand. You can see big difference between the control stand and local heating stand. Uh, tissue hyperplasia in local stand and a little bit in 80 degrees uh, watt. And a protein 17 and tonal expressions were increased in heat groups compared to group A. You can see just the yellowish color. That is a uh, uh, heat shock protein and also tonal expressions. So there are more in comparison with the control group. Uh, this is a KI67 and this is a BRDU uh, expressions. You can see the KI67 and the BRDU expressions were less prominent in local heating group than in control group. The tissue hyperplasia related variables such as gradient tissue area and epithelial layer numbers and submucosal fibrosis thickness and the connective tissue area percentage and collagen deposition degree uh, was significantly higher in group A than in the other groups. And also the epithelial uh, layer numbers and alpha SMA positive degrees and HASP, Hisha protein 70 positive degree expressions in group D was higher than those in group B and C. I'd like to move on to the second topic, branched gold nanoparticle coated nitrogen stand in the stomach. We used the 45 rat for this study and divided the rats in three groups. Group A received just the nitrogen stand without uh, photothermal therapy. Group B, again, branched gold nanoparticle coated stand with photothermal therapy at 55 degrees. Group C, without photothermal therapy. So the technique was different from the esophagus. And we also used the nitro stent, uh, five millimeters in diameter and eight millimeters long. We performed the local heating once for 60 seconds, seven days after stent placement only in group B. And the five red per group with or without heating was sacrificed after local heating. And the remaining red was sacrificed four weeks after stand placement. You can see the flow diagram showing the randomization process and study follow up. Uh, fortunately or interesting, we didn't have any complications. So the result was different from the esophagus. I will explain why. Again, uh, five animals per group were sacrificed after local heating for Western blood analysis, and the remaining red was sacrificed four weeks after stent placement for histologic examination. This slide shows the technical steps in stent placement. A six French stent delivery system was introduced over guide wire across the stomach and the duodenal bulb on the proscopy through a surgical uh, gastrostomy. And then after stent placement, the proximal end of the stent was sutured to the gastric tissue 
to prevent its migration, followed by punctocyte suit. That's why the migration rate was 0% in this group. After that, contrast upper GI study was performed to check the location of the stent. Here you can see stomach and duodenum. Here you can see stent breaching the gastric outlet. And this is the duodenum and the proximal jejunum. This slide shows the technical steps in photo thermal mediated local heating. For uh, near infrared laser radiation, uh, one millimeter optic fiber, as I mentioned for the esophageal uh, stand placement, it was same, was passed through the six French sheets into the stent lumen, and then we performed the local heating. Uh, this is an image obtained during heating, 10 seconds after starting heating, and 50 seconds. Here you can see abrupt temperature increase after heating, and then abrupt decrease after stop the heating. The, this is a in vitro, and this is in vivo. The in vivo heating temperatures was 10.8% lower than the in vitro heating temperatures. That's because uh, in vivo there is a uh, uh, vessels. Okay, uh, this is a HE stain. This is a Mason trichrome stain. Wonderful result. No hyperplasia and. Uh, heating group and severe hyperplasia and the control and also uh, the C group. And then this is a uh, CD31 and uh, this is a uh, tunnel expressions. You can see the CD31 in group B was lower than in group and C. And this is uh, just vessels in group A and group C, but no vessels in group uh, B. And also tunnel expressions in group B were higher than in group A and C uh, than in group B. That means uh, uh, this is again the yellowish color. You can see the this is the expression is higher than group B, than in group A and group C. The mean percentage of granulation tissue area and connective tissue area and mean collagen deposition degrees and CD31 positive degree in group B were significantly lower than in groups A and C, but uh, there were no significant difference in group A and C. Hishak protein uh, 70 expressions in group B was significantly higher than in uh, higher in group B than in group A and C. You can see that this is again control group and significantly higher expression in group B. The, this is a KI67. The KI67 positive mesothelial monolayer in group B was more prominent uh, than in group A and B. This is, here you can see the details in group B. In conclusion, moderate local heating with the nano functional resistance represent a promising new approach for suppressing stent induced tissue hyperplasia in the red esophagus and the GI tract. But further studies are warranted to refine the optimal temperature ranges and timing for local heating.
Dr. Son, tell us about funding for research. What, what ideas do you have for funding the projects and how do you get to be so successful with the all the funding sources that you get? Is this through a government, industry, a combination of everything? Okay, uh, that's a good question. And you know that uh, my seed money was exactly just uh, four, $4,000 in the beginning, but that was my seed money. After that, I received a small grant, like a palmat, exactly like the same thing uh, in the hospital, but it was not good enough. That's why I wanted to learn how they received the grant. So I met many PhDs. After that, uh, I decided to move as a medical center. Fortunately, as a medical center, they have clinical funding and research funding. It was a little bit competitive, but it was not that difficult for me because I had a subject. So I started that uh, receiving funding from the Asan Medical Center and then government. Like uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we applied for grant for Morrison Fund, right? Last year, yeah. but it was rejected. But you can revise it again and again. Uh, mm -hmm. I had the same thing, exactly like uh, our first project. Our first project was rejected three times. It is same. We can try it again and again after uh, improvement and modification. Uh, and then eventually you can get funded. Second idea is that uh, you have a wonderful relationship with the company. So uh, it's good for you. You can ask them to uh, give fund, but there should be uh, a refund. Uh, how, how can you have to uh, give it back. For example, mm -hmm. you can give your idea to the company. So also they have uh, manpower. You can invite one person from the company. So uh, you have uh, three rooms. You can have a chair for one person from a company and from a uh, chair for technology. It's time to uh, hire one technologist you can teach them. Otherwise, uh, it's difficult. And then I, I guarantee I can send you two Chinese doctors who are excellent. The hospital pay them. But if you have a fund, you can pay the a little, a little bit, like uh, just a thousand dollars a month. Uh, but it's, you, it is not necessary, but they will appreciate your help, but not right now. If you have a research fund, eventually, uh, I strongly recommend that you have to support Dr. John Walker. It's time to support him. He can make it. I think uh, <clears throat> in our system, we have a lot of um, competing uh, positions to be in. Um, the uh, so even whenever I get dedicated academic time, it's not mm -hmm. even necessarily research time because there's um, different committee meetings that I have to attend that are on the clinical side. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of those clinical meetings, um, the director of clinical research position is less about me doing research and more about me um, overseeing how research from other departments interacts with the Department of Radiology uh, and the policies that interact in in those uh, in that system, and like one of the big projects that we've been working on, I've been working with uh, Cal Clark as our informatics guy, uh, and Sunapar as our liaison to the mark is creating a a streamlined way of of giving resist reads or other specialized research reads to our other clinical clinicians. Um, that's kind of in the infancy now. Uh, we have a few people who are starting to bring in uh, reads that way, um, but it's a potential way to start generating revenue on the research side uh, that actually falls into the research uh, monies. 
mm -hmm. creates some residual for research funds. Um, of course, the idea there, because it's on the clinical side, is to build up a, a more of a like a clinical research organization within radiology in such a way that um, it, we can almost create like AI labs and other clinical research from from that uh, regard. Uh, so, so you know, I guess for me, um, when I do get this academic time, which um, is starting to become a little bit more apparent on my on my actual physical schedule, um, it's it's still very divided. And then the academic time itself has been, um, for whatever reason, and I think it comes down to when it's clinically available, uh, it doesn't always fall in the same path as everybody else's availability. You know, like our big day for, I, I don't know what it is about Wednesdays, but Wednesdays is the day that uh, people are harvesting organs, the day that we can get organs. It's also the day that we do all of our interviews and that Dr. Croman needs his academic time uh, to do and run the program effectively um, for the residency. And so because the residency is trumps what I'm doing, you know, he will always get that academic time on on his Wednesdays. And so I will always have to find another day that doesn't necessarily coordinate with research time that's that could be effectively used to to get the the organs and, and be hands on with the with the tissues. Um, so I think a lot of the time I've been using is to try to coordinate with the students who are available on those days and then and then in small spans of time actually physically try to be there for 30 minutes just to see what's going on um, and help troubleshoot. And so a lot of a lot of my research time that I do get is kind of made, you know, like tomorrow I'm supposed to meet with a, with a couple of students as soon as my clinic is done to give them enough time to make sure a project is going to make it um, for the SIR posters that, that was created <laughs> with them. And, and so, so it's just, uh, it's like little pieces here and there. And so it's, there's never like this consistency. Yeah. Uh, but I, that's, understand, you know, I understand your position, but if you have uh, two visitors from outside the uh, United States, you can have just one or two hours a week, but now nobody uh, is involved in research. So uh, probably someone should refocus on the priorities back to research because uh, uh, translational research can uh, earn money. There is difference between MR or I, as I mentioned before, Dr. Clark, and also Fox are excellent, but that is different. Translational research can earn money. So you have to invest money. You have a lot wonderful opportunity, but that is my suggestion. I'm sorry, I always like to push your team. I, I think we have to be pushed. I mean, I think, uh, <laughs> I think it's great to have somebody who can come in and look at it from an external view and say, hey, look, this is what needs to be done. Um, if you want to be successful, this is how you need to you know, restructure, regroup. Um, so I always I always like being pushed. I think uh, without being pushed, um, it's easy to let things to the side, you know, uh, other priorities start taking over. OK, it's time to finish. Uh, Dr. Walker, you can close. Yes. Well, thank you so much for that lecture. It was a great lecture. Um, I, the, uh, I actually had some questions pertaining to it, but uh, um, we covered a lot of material, so I can always ask you offline. The, um, but again, thank you for the presentation and thank you for helping um, build up research where it is to, uh, at this point in time, um, before you came, uh, we barely had anything. Um, it was really just some random, random little things here and there in an apartment, and it's grown uh, exponentially since you've been here. And uh, hopefully, we can keep uh, keep that torch going once uh, once you leave us.